let's let's get started. Uh, my name is Tom Mendel, and I'm very much looking forward to hosting this panel talk between experts in the field of fine art insurance, fine art conservation and restoration, collecting, and also the gallery side of things, the the art dealing side. Um, we're we're very excited to touch on lots of different points over the course of the next 45 minutes or so, and then we'll have a Q&A session at the end, and you can put your questions into the chat as the webinar goes on, and we'll then select some and we'll put them to the panelists. But without further ado, I think I'll let each panelist introduce themselves. And we'll start with Stephen. Oh, we're not doing it alphabetically then. Really <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Stephen Ongpin. Um, I'm a dealer in uh, drawings and watercolors, works on paper. However, not, not photographs or prints, but drawings and watercolors from the 15th century to the 21st century, really. Um, I'm based in London and have been basically doing this for about 35 years. Brilliant. And John McGigan. Hi, it's um, John McGigan. My wife, Mary, and I are both collectors and scholars of uh, 18th and 19th century American artists working in Italy, primarily Rome and Florence. Uh, we started collecting uh, shortly before we were married, and we have written uh, five or six catalogs and contributed to many exhibitions. But part of it uh, has been a wonderful journey of collecting for 30 years and, and learning how to look as John Propenesi uh, so aptly titled his book. And so uh, I'm happy to be included with this and thank you to James for asking me. Brilliant. And James, if you could introduce yourself. Hello, um, I'm James Farrow. I'm the head of fine arts at Lockton Insurance Brokers. Um, we specialize in fine arts insurance and look after art collectors, dealers and museums and exhibitions. And it's a, a pleasure to be on the panel um, with such a, an erudite, um, group of people and look forward to speaking about it. Thank you. And Harriet? Yes, my name is Harriet Stratus. I am a paper conservator as well as a technical art historian. So bringing material studies and care of collections and, and repair all together in my practice. I'm located in Chicago in New York and I um, have been practicing for about 35 years as well. Brilliant. And finally, Sarah. Hi there. I'm Sarah Allen, and um, I'm a photographic materials conservator in private practice. Um, I work with a book conservator, um, and we are, have a joint partnership as Lux and Livra. I'm the light, she's the books. And as part of our um, job, I also work as a, a a photographic conservator part-time for the National Portrait Gallery. Uh, we're based in Somerset and Wiltshire and London in the UK. Brilliant. So I think that's everyone. So we'll start off with one of the questions which I think most occupies um, the, the sort of everyday person, which is what to look for when looking at photographs and works on paper. So I think, Sarah, actually, you're, you're very well placed for this one in terms of photographs. What, um, when you're approaching the, just the average photograph, what does one look for in terms of condition? What does one look for in terms of its potential longevity or whether it's, um, it's something best to be avoided? Great question. Thanks, Tom. Um, so photographs are a funny thing because their very process is a degradatory process by the way they're made, um, which is by the action of light on a chemically sensitized surface. Um, they essentially start to degrade from the moment they're made. Um, so uh, there are, they can be some of the most sensitive materials that you have to look after. But that's not to say I don't want to put people off because actually, ironically, some of the older processes. So, um, for example, um, silver based black and white gelatin prints from the early 20th century and still which is still made today are actually extremely stable items. 
Um, and ironically, some of the more modern materials such as um, digital prints um, made with inks rather than pigments, for example, can fade very quickly. Um, so it's tricky to kind of briefly talk about what to look for. But I think it's essentially something that we're probably all familiar with because we all have our own photographic collection. So if you see a photograph and it's faded, um, we, we recognise that kind of degradation. You don't have to be a specialist to be able to see that. That might not be the one for you. I think it's also quite subjective. So I'll be talking a little bit about a camera work that I worked on for an upcoming exhibition at the MPG. And that's she's interesting because... Um, quite a lot of her works are not very well processed. So they have fading marks and they have kind of swirls in the background, but that's very much part of her working practice. So those imperfections are actually really what I would class as um, something that makes that so exciting, unique because she was such a pioneer of early photography. So I think what I'm trying to say is look for something that you love. I think that probably is the, the best place. And if you can accept that something's faded or not perfect. From a conservation point of view, I think that's fine. Um, I think it's hard to recommend a certain type of process because actually that's really limiting. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And I think that, that ties very neatly into John, your experience, because I know although your condition is, of course, it's a consideration, your collection is encyclopedic and it's kind of its purpose. So is, is condition a major consideration or when you're collecting in a, a very particular field, is the aim really to, to acquire as many works as possible? I, I suppose as, as a thinking of our collection as a didactic uh, collection, as much as an aesthetic one, um, it, it occasionally does not bother us to have things in poor condition because you learn by looking at uh, condition to, to judge a, the quality of a photograph. Uh, but I would also say that it, it, it's interesting, it, uh, American museums and collectors have a very low threshold for poor condition or fading uh, in photography or even you know, in anything, in, in, in paintings, sculpture, uh, in drawings. Whereas European collectors and museums have a very high threshold uh, and it's usually the rarity uh, or quality of the work that's more important than the condition. And so that's a, been a balance that we've tried to achieve because we, we would hope someday that our collection uh, goes to a, a, a teaching institution where we feel that some of the works uh, of inferior quality can inform the students as to why uh, you know, things do degrade or, or why they're in bad condition. But for us, generally, we try to find works that are in, in the best condition. But the, the, there are also so many caveats, as, as alluded to before, that uh, the early processes, uh, the calotypes that, that Talbot uh, invented, uh, you know, are usually in very poor condition and, and so light sensitive they can't be displayed. You usually have to display a facsimile. And then when the, the salt paper process uh, became very prominent, painters really responded to it because of certain qualities. They, they liked very rough paper because the, the tonalities, the sort of honey coloration that, that was uh, prevalent in the process looked like a canvas or looked like a sepia drawing. And many uh, painter photographers uh, were gravitated towards that and, and tried to make their things look a certain way with a certain sfumato appearance uh, that, that we today would maybe think would be not great condition. It also depends on early photography when it went through the bath, uh, you know, if it got the full dose of chemicals or it got the, the diluted chemicals, whether it's going to, to have a longevity. And these are all things you can see when you look at a photograph. But all that changes when you get to the uh, collodion process, which was really uh, you know, equal to the daguerreotype in terms of precision. And, and that changes the way you look at condition. Uh, you have to be more, uh, I think, more rigid with the, the collodion process because bad condition usually has to do with storage. Uh, things like, you know, poor humidity, high humidity, high heat, uh, being left in a wood drawer for 100 years, various things. So, so those are all, all factors. But as, 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 a, as a collector and a scholar, I, I do value rarity as much as, as aesthetics. And that's something that, that most collectors don't necessarily want to take into account if they want the very finest examples. And, and, and as it relates to, as the question relates to drawings, Stephen, when when you're analysing whether or not to purchase work either for your own gallery or on behalf of a client, is condition always among the very first considerations? Or as John was saying, does sometimes the rarity really outweigh all other considerations? 
No, I think I think it's true that I would say that my threshold for condition is, you know, um, different for a 15th century drawing than it would be for a 19th or 20th century drawing. Um, the rarity does, you know, have um, have some relevance so that, you know, a, a work uh, from the 16th century that is by an artist that I love, but it might not be in perfect condition, I'm much more willing to, you know, try and buy it than I would be a Degas, for example, because I do buy it across that range, um, that isn't in, in good condition. Um, a lot of it also is sort of, I think, from, from experience, learning what sort of uh, condition problems can be resolved fairly easily by a conservator and what problems are, you know, irreversible. And that also, I think, affects. So as a dealer, I think you come to understand a little bit, the more you do it, which sorts of drawings, um, you know, although they may look, they may look like they're in bad condition to the untrained eye, you might be able to know, well, actually, that's that's oxidized white heightening that can be reversed quite simply, for example. So, um, but you know, condition is one of the most important things, you know, uh, that that one looks at when when deciding, you know, at least when I do, uh, when deciding what to what to buy. Rarity does come into play though, because you know, I I um, I know one one collector who was um, not all that. I mean, as as John said, actually, it, it tends to be a European thing. Uh, a, 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 European collectors and and museum collectors tend to have. Uh, give more leeway, if you like, uh, to or, or to uh, have you know uh, uh, favor sort of rarity or importance over condition to some extent. Uh, I knew one collector who um, you know it never bothered him the condition of a work if the work was a particularly uh, important or rare example. He, for example, bought two El Greco drawings, two small El Greco drawings, who's a, a very rare draftsman there are very few drawings by him and he bought them even though they were not great condition because he wanted to have examples of of this particular artist's work and and, and there are not many around um but it is it is very much a case of i think you know uh striking a balance between between condition and other factors i think yeah it's it's interesting that both of you have said it's a learning process over the course of potentially several decades you come to see what's immediately rep reparable and then there'll be times where you simply can't resist buying something even though it's in less than perfect condition james when you're when you're advising clients on things like ensuring works which potentially are very very fragile i mean an el greco drawing it would cost a considerable amount to ensure it in the first place but what's what are your sort of pointers that you give to collectors vis-a-vis -vis works on paper that potentially are very, very fragile and, and frangible even. Yeah, I, th I think it would depend really on the the nature of, of the collector. Um, and, and particularly, I mean, speaking to, to, to John um, a, a couple of weeks ago, obviously um, it, his collection is, is you know museum standards and kept in, in that sort of conditions um and, and approached in that way um whereas i think you know there, there'll be a range of, of collectors who require different types of advice around um things like storage um the main reason there is because particularly from the insurer's perspective uh across the policy wordings you generally have exclusions for um the deterior gradual deterioration, um, warping, um, and and things that uh, potentially temperature and atmospheric conditions, um, the effects that they can have on on works, um, particularly on, on paper and, and photography. So, when it comes to to collection, um, with that nature, then insurers will ask a lot more questions around the storage conditions and and how they're kept. Um, so whether they're, they're kept in cylinder boxes or you know, acid-free um, paper wraps, et cetera. Um, and, and so from that perspective, I, th I think it's 
it's important to be part of the process um, around the, the, the general care for the collection um, and, and helping guide them through with, with experts such as um, Sarah and, and, and Harriet. And it's interesting, I mean, the, the everyday collection is often just what's on the walls in people's homes, but John, yours is, I mean, it's, it's exceptional, would be an understatement. How many, how many works in total are kept within the teaching collection as a whole? We have, uh, so far, I would say about 10,000 photographs, but I still haven't catalogued uh, things like stereographs or um, uh, carte de visites or cabinet cards. And so it's probably going to be double that, but it's, it's, it's very time consuming because I, Mary and I act as the, the curators, directors, uh, registrars, and art handlers and preparators. So it's, uh, it's, we wear a lot of hats, but uh, I'd also say we've got about 2000 works on paper generally, including sketchbooks. And it's, um, but one of the things I, I meant to touch on before was that it's, it's, as you start to collect, it is so important to talk to people with, with greater knowledge. And so to talk to somebody like Stephen or to you or, and then I think I found sometimes the most I've learned is talking to conservators, looking at works with conservators, because there's no obligation for that, that they have to conserve it if you buy it or don't buy it, but that you learn so much about what the possibilities are. And there was, there was a, a work we bought in Paris last year that uh, several conservators said it wouldn't clean. And it cleaned beautifully because it was just mold. And it, it's, it's back to pristine condition. And yet, I think uh, nobody else bid on this work because they were terrified that the condition was going to be uh, you know, atrocious. And so I think that, that so much of what we do is, is, is built upon the knowledge of others and, and talking to people. And everybody wants to talk. Maybe uh, Stephen doesn't want to talk to people at Maastricht after he's been on his feet for four days. But... Uh, generally speaking, I find that everybody is so open and willing to share their information, and that is the best way to learn and, and the best way to develop uh, yourself as a collector. And as, as your collection is growing, I'll, I'll flick to some of the images of how the collection is housed. As your collection is growing, presumably you've taken on board both conservators and insurers' advice as to how best to store things when they're being handled regularly. Yes, and when we first started collecting photographer, we had no idea. Uh, it was really not something that was uh, you know, ever explained to us. It, it's different for work on paper. And, and as, as Stephen pointed out, or as, as actually as you pointed out, early on, all of our works of art were hung on the wall. And then when you run out of wall space, you realize you have two options. One is to, to uh, exchange works, stop collecting, or uh, rotate. And so we began to mat things to standard sizes and to get standard exhibition frames, just like museums do for exhibitions, so that we could rotate works. And with photography, uh, the, the thing we learned the most is that climate and environment are, are key. Nothing will destroy a collection faster than uh, heat and humidity. And so it, it took a while, and I talked to a lot of dealers and other collectors, and we began to realize that it was easier to store photographs in mylar sleeves. Uh, there's a great company in the UK called Seacall, uh, dot com that, that, that we buy from and and then you keep them in uh, purpose-built photo boxes that you see they're the gray boxes in the back wall and, and that way you can store 50 to 100 photographs uh, in, in a box as opposed to if you mat something you're lucky to get 10 to 15 per box and so they start to take up a lot of space and so so for us it was really uh, when we began collecting we decided to focus on the collection and worry about the facility or the house or the museum later and so we built this facility in 2017 after collecting for 25 years. And so for us, this was the culmination. Uh, and we knew exactly what we wanted and how we wanted to store it because we want to present this in a museum style fashion so that it does instill uh, confidence with uh, curators and, and, and uh, scholars to borrow from us or to illustrate our works. And eventually uh, we, we, we've just formed a partnership with the University of Delaware to bring in summer interns. And so we have a facility where they know they can research and learn without it being sort of the, the average clutter if this were just in drawers and closets all over our house. I'm sure, Sarah, this must be a familiar sight for you going into the MPG, presumably at the museum level, you're seeing this, but on an even greater scale. Is there, are there significant differences between how museums are required to store their photography collection versus what, I mean, John, John is obviously at the very top of a kind of private collection versus the ordinary person with a photograph of ancestors. 
Well, I was going to say this is a conservative's dream, John. It's absolutely <laughs> beautiful. Um, yeah, this is a familiar scene, but I would say that um, certainly in the institutions that I work in, we battle in the UK in particular, I think, a lack of resources for conservation. And actually, um, I think there's a lack of status or there has been a lack of status of photography within institutions as well which means that often there's still room for improvement shall we say in um our collections in our institutions but this is yes yeah, something to aim for for sure and as john was talking about the environment is absolutely crucial with um when caring for photographs in the long term and that's something that we do do very well um especially at the mpg um, so we control the humidity and temperature in our stores um, and we really, really carefully control light, for example, um, by limiting and recording really carefully our exhibition process and um, making sure that we don't overexpose our objects as well. And Harriet, I haven't, I haven't come to you yet, but for museums and drawings, I mean, over museums have been collecting drawings for considerably longer than even the medium of photography has existed and collectors have been collecting drawings. When, when you're thinking about the primary concerns for storing traditional works on paper, so drawings, pastels, watercolours, what are the first few things that, that come to mind for you? Well, I think I can start by saying everything that Sarah has said and John has said apply equally to drawings. Uh, the difference becomes in the nature of the materials themselves. So for example, when you talk about it immediately pastel, uh, charcoal drawings, black chalk drawings, where you have a friable surface, a powdery surface, the way you're going to treat a work of art that has a delicate surface is going to be very different than say, putting it into a folder and into a mat and in a box because you have to protect those surfaces. And so, um, in many instances, you'd like to keep those permanently framed. There are new products on the market that prevent glass from breaking because with a, 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 a regular plexiglass, you can get a static charge. And the last thing you want is static to draw particles from the surface of the drawing onto the, onto the perspex. And so there are products now that are static free, um, low reflective. And so if you really want to protect those materials, you're going to be taking extra steps, extra precautions that you wouldn't necessarily need to take with an old master drawing where those surfaces are very stable, where those particles are not so much on the surface any longer, but in the paper, in a sense, embedded, um, married to the paper fibers. Watercolors, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is light exposure. Um, always light exposure. And as you move from old masters into the 19th century and into the 20th century, as modern materials enter the marketplace and we go from um, materials that are very stable, like the chalks, to pastels that are made with dyes, light is going to have a profound effect on how those works of art change. Yeah, I'm sure everyone's familiar with um, both the, the sort of the perfect 19th century watercolor where the blues are radiant, the greens are thick, exactly. and then the yellow sky with the brown instead of green. And is that, I know it's it's probably too, um, too basic a question, but what, when you, when you see a work of that sort, which has degraded over time, is there a sort of, is there a tangible point at which it's beyond repair? Or are you generally optimistic that at least some of the original brightness, the original sharpness can be brought back? Um, sadly, once materials fade, they've faded forever. Yeah. Um, at least in today, I mean, I don't know in the future if there might be some magic techniques that come about, but once the colorant is gone, 
there's no way, there's no no act that a conservator can take that will bring that color back. And so going back to what Sarah was saying about some of these early photographs, we like to, as conservators, talk about a patina of age and change that we accept and in many instances appreciate in early photographs and certainly in these drawings because we know there's no going back. I mean, perhaps you could do a little bit to, to shift the tone of the paper, to make the paper a bit brighter, um, but you're never going to bring those colors back. Stephen, I'm sure that's often the most heartbreaking thing when, when a drawing arrives and you realize that the, perhaps the images you've seen don't bear any relation to the reality and that it really is beyond repair. But when you're when you're buying and when you're when you're looking through catalogues and auctions, um, when it comes to keeping when it when it so you, I remember you you said that you've developed a sort of awareness of what conservators can do and what they can't do. What do you advise your own collectors when when they're acquiring, say, uh, a watercolor or a pastel in terms of how they should continue to care for it? Well, I think if they're, if they're acquiring it from me, um, they at least have the reassurance that it's properly mounted in acid-free mats and, and, and with, with UV glass and framed properly and everything. When a, when a collector comes to me and asks about something that's coming up at auction, for example, um, I'm always happy to look at something if it's if 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 I'm there, um, but uh, you know there is no substitute for looking at the actual work, unframing it. I mean, I am uh, I'm someone who when I when I go to an auction, when I look at drawings, as one of our attendees will <laughs> will will no doubt know, I unframe everything that I'm interested in. I I look at everything, even if it looks to be in really good condition. I like to look, you know, like to unframe everything that I that I'm interested in, to look at the back of the paper, to take, you know, photographs of it. Um, and yes, there are times when you see a wonderful drawing and you just know that it's, you know, it's too far gone. Um, it, it's just not something you uh you can improve in any way. And um it's a shame. But um you know if you can't stand in front of a work of art and or at an auction or at, at a gallery and and look at it unframed, which is incidentally something that we as, a, as as dealers do all the time for clients when they come, you know, you can ask for a condition report, which is a, a whole other thing. But you know, auction houses do provide them. They're generally fairly basic. Uh, we can also one can also ask for an independent condition report from someone uh, like uh, Harriet or or Sarah. Uh, to, to provide a sort of independent uh, view of it. But um, very rarely do I buy something that I haven't either seen myself or had someone look at on my behalf or had a very good condition report. Or, and, and very often, uh, if it's, let's say from an auction that I haven't been to, I ask for photographs. I ask for the auction house to unframe it. I want to see the back of it. I want to see how it looks you know, out of the frame. And a lot of that is just sort of, you know, it's it's the way I prefer to do things. I don't want those surprises when something arrives and it's not what I expected. So luckily I don't have that disappointment too often, I'm, I'm pleased to say. <laughs> it does happen though, but not all, but less and less. Yeah. And when it comes to when it comes to handling the works once once they're um beyond the auction house or once the conservators at the museum. I think um, Harriet, I'll I'll start with you. What are the what are some of the pointers with handling the actual drawing, which everyday people should should consider? I mean, we're all familiar with the images of Sotheby's porters wearing pristine white gloves. Um, but uh, did you did you go through sort of extensive training before beginning your career with it? Or yeah, tell us about it. Well, well, I think I want to back up and just say that one of the first steps that's taken by a museum when then they're considering the purchase of a work of art to to echo Stephen is they're brought into the museum and the first place they go is the conservation lab. So during my many years at the Art Institute of Chicago, we examined everything 
that was that came into the museum um, because you're surprised sometimes a uh, piece of paper will fade and if you look at the back it's a completely different color than when you look at the front so I just wanted to to add that but in terms of handling we spend a lot of time working with say study room attendants with with um, visitors to the collection and we talk about just basics things like if you're you're around a work of art of course you want it in an enclosed uh, many times as possible, we don't want to handle the actual work of art. But of course, when you do, the first thing we say to a visitor is, please wash your hands. Standard course, please use pencils. Um, in case something happens, you're not using ink around a drawing, a printer, a drawing. Um, to put things on easels if they're in mats. Um, to work slowly, to not lift piles of art, to work singly. So to be thoughtful and mindful about your handling. Um, when you're handling actual works of art, however, I, I'm going to be, um, there, there are colleagues who aren't going to appreciate this, but I hate gloves. Now for photographs, it's a completely different story because of these surfaces. But when you're when you're wearing gloves, you're you're removed from the paper. You're you're not feeling it. You're not understanding it. And even if you're just trying to handle it, I'd much rather have someone use clean hands, take a drawing, use a delicate touch, and move it. Or even with students, understand it, really feel it. Is it a is it a hard paper? Is it a soft paper? Is it sized? Isn't it? So I'm not a big fan of gloves. So we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> And we'll hear we'll hear the contrasting opinion regarding gloves from from Sarah. Can you tell us a little bit about the potential damage caused by a slightly clammy hand? Sure. So I totally agree with you, Harriet, and um, everything that you've been saying. I think the the issue is. Um, is white gloves actually i i also hate gloves and specifically white gloves there's just no need for them they they reduce your manual dexterity they look great on telly and that's about as good as <laughs> well, yeah. that's, that's their benefit so um yeah as harriet pointed out handling paper with clean dry hands that allows you to really understand the surface and feel the delicacy of the paper is totally acceptable. The difference with photographic materials is that they have a different surface and they are metal based often, or most of the majority of them are silver based images. And the oils that you secrete from your hands and the moisture and, you know, medications that you're taking secrete out of your, your fingertips, all sorts of things come out of your fingers and you leave residues on that surface and they will eventually cause tarnishing in the future. So even if you can't see anything immediately from where you've been handling something, eventually um, you will end up with silver mirroring. So I'm sure everybody's familiar with that, um, that process here, which is essentially oxidized silver because of the pollutants that you've left on that print. So that's the exception. But I always say, don't please don't use cotton gloves for that purpose use well fitting that's really crucial as well because i often see people with really big baggy <laughs> gloves trying to hold their prints well fitting nitrile gloves not no powder because you don't want the horrible powder to be getting anywhere and um, but i think crucially with handling as harriet was saying handle it as little as possible so actually if you can handle the housing or you can use um some sort of support like a mount board to move your print around that's probably the best rule of thumb not to not to touch it or handle it at all thinking of the um yeah the potential potential damage caused by just hands i'm sure um my former boss isn't isn't tuned into this so he won't mind me saying i used to work with someone who he personally specialized with arms and armor and i did once manage to slice a finger on an 18th century japanese sword and his first concern was absolutely for the blade and not my finger which, um, <laughs> yeah, at the time took me aback but in hindsight he was absolutely right there were thousands of pounds on the line <laughs> i'm not sure about that because actually that's a really good point tom is that by wearing gloves you're also protecting yourself from the stuff that's on historic material and what we often find with photographic material is that it's very moldy because especially if it's got a gelatin substrate then 
you know, gelatin just loves to be eaten by mold. And you also want to protect yourself. So that's another benefit for wearing gloves in the right context. Um, and also, you know, protecting yourself from really sharp swords is probably another reason. <laughs> to James, I'm sure, I'm sure clients frequency of handling their works or even just the works being handled is a major concern. You must have clients who have works loaned regularly out to museums for exhibition than ones who would really rather that they stayed very safely in storage. Can you tell us a little bit about the sort of differences that you see in approach? Yeah, I think the, the most important thing to do, and, and we touched on it quite a bit here, is, is around the condition checking. Um, immediately before you start packing an artwork or, or work on paper. Um, if you can get the likes of, of Harry or Sarah to, to come and do a full condition check on it, um, particularly if it's going uh, for sale, um, that's that's the most important thing. I, we, we had a, a client recently who was selling a, a work from a European collection to somewhere in America, um, and it was the condition was was paramount um it's particularly delicate artwork and it was it was incredibly important to have a, an in-depth condition check done uh, to work with insurers around the, the packing and how shipping was going to be done um but I, I think you know using using the experts um at hand um the professional packers and shippers um you're doing everything you can to protect that artwork and ensure it gets from A to B in the same condition. Um, but the, the, the detailed condition checks are, are a very useful tool in, in doing that um, and making sure that if condition does change, um, you, you can pinpoint exactly when that happened. I know um, some, of, some of the most sort of viral moments in the art world online, uh, those, um, extremely popular before and after conservation videos and I think obviously if a work is in pristine condition and is going off to a museum where the idea is that the condition be maintained that's one thing but Harriet I know you were talking with me about some works where they're in the museum collection and the aim after they've perhaps been in storage for some time is to bring them back to how they once were insofar as that's possible um, can you tell me a little bit about the challenges of that and when it's appropriate and when museums decide to pursue that course? Well, um, let's start by going back to one of the images of the old master drawings that I shared with you, right? up. Oh, nope, there. Yeah. So if we look at this um, very simple comparison of a before and after, this is an old master drawing. And I, I think Stephen touched upon the idea of lead white oxidation. And you can think of this again as the, the tarnishing of your family silver. Only here we've got lead that, that's darkening over time. And if I were to um, go through a box of drawings and find this and present it to my curator and ask if they would use it in an exhibition, the, the uh, answer would be an emphatic never. Um, but with conservation intervention in this case, there are straightforward techniques that can be used. And as you see in the after treatment, um, we end up with a beautiful result. Um, the white heightening has been, uh, revived, restored. Um, and so you read the, diff the drawing very differently after conservation. And so sometimes these interventions can be straightforward, can be done in a safe, conservative manner. And the result is extraordinary. Yes, I mean, if I could just interrupt here. So, you know, if, if a client, and this has happened to me many times, a client may say, I really like this drawing, but it's, look at it, it on the left here, the image on the left, you know, it, it's a shame, it's ruined. And I'm, I'll, I'll say, no, actually, you shouldn't have that, because actually it, it is something that can be, uh, you know, reversed and improved and and don't, don't you know, don't reject it because you think it's a, it's a wreck. It's not in this particular case. So, that happens a lot, and and you know there is something always I think to be said for, uh, um, because you know a, a condition report. Let's say this drawing, this drawing that Harrods uh, just this image. Let's say this came up at auction, 
Uh, the condition report would say that the oxidized, that the lead, the white hiding has oxidized. It won't say that it can be easily reversed. <laughs> it'll just, it'll be, you know, straightforward in fact. So that's in a, in a way sometimes I think, I mean, I, over my career, I can't tell the number of times that I've sort of talked down, you know, collectors off a ledge saying, don't worry, actually, it, it's something that can be, uh, can be fixed. Now that's not always the case, but certainly in this case, this is something that, that, uh, is relatively um, straightforward to, to improve. And John, you mentioned earlier that sometimes that's worked to your advantage, where you've seen something and you've known that it can be restored, and so it's put other people off potentially acquiring it. It has, and there are also there, there are several, uh, several artists that we would love to have represented in our drawings collection, but every time we, we find the perfect example, there's been a, a previous intervention uh, by, a, by a, a subpar conservator and it's spoiled the, the work and it will never come back. But I, I think a, another interesting aspect is, is foxing, which is for those who don't know, uh, when paper is made, uh, it, it's, it's the pulp is ground up uh, with, with, uh, with, with steel uh, turbines. And oftentimes a lot of the steel comes off and gets in the paper and that will over time rust and create these little rust spots known as foxing. There's also little mold stains and mold stains are much more easy to reverse. But in the past, you could fix foxing to my knowledge, uh, but it would come back. But I've understand that there are now techniques that can make it more permanent, which I would love to hear uh, Harry and Sarah speak about. Yeah, Harriet, do you want to um, tell us first about that and drawings and then we'll come to we'll come to Sarah as well. Uh, it's it's there has to be a degree of nuance because in many instances, when you try to reduce foxing, if you're successful by adjusting pH and conductivity of water and just using an adjusted water, that's something that can work very well. When you start getting into actually having to remove the staining using bleaches, using more chemical intervention, that's where you need to take a step back and really think about how necessary it is or whether you're willing to again look at it more from the perspective of the patina of age um, and accept some of that foxing because the interventions can be rather invasive um, and once you do bleach something then you have to get the bleach out of the paper um, and so there are techniques that have been developed using gels where you're introducing what could potentially be a harsh chemical in very dilute amounts. And so learning these new techniques are very helpful, um, again, to being as conservative and non-invasive while still achieving the goals you want to achieve. Um, I can say in the 1960s paper conservation, it was bright, it was white, and it was flat. <laughs> and those, those were some of the goals, and those are not the goals, um, thankfully, any longer. So, I hope yeah. that answers to a bit, Sarah. Um, I disagree with everything you say, Harriet. There's not really much more that I can add. Um, I think there's less options with photographs anyway for treatment because of the nature of having a photographic emulsion and that kind of treatment um, with bleaching. Um, you know, generally just don't do it at all. The only options is with, with something like a, um, a platinum print where, um, as we know, you often get, um, it acts as a catalyst for acid hydrolysis of the paper, or we can do gentle washing to, to, um, to help with that. But um, yeah, we, we have a lot less um, tools in our armor for photographs, as, I suppose, as conservators. I just want to say what a beautiful job you did of this one as well. It's gorgeous. It's so That's nice to see that. I think it is important also for a lot of collectors and a lot of dealers as well, you know, to be able to have a paper conservator, in my case, or a conservator, works in paper conservator, who they know and trust and, and they can um, they can turn to for advice on, on technical matters. Uh, with you know things one's considering of buying or or has has bought. I mean, uh, you know, certainly I have an image here, I think, of a drawing by Batista Franco, Tom. That, yeah. So this this drawing here um uh is a copy by Batista Franco of a drawing by Michelangelo, which is the Ashmolean. And this actually doesn't belong to me, it belongs to a to a private collector, but when I saw it, it was 
it it was this it was a sheet of paper uh as you can see it was sort of uh, trimmed at the at the left edge and it was a little bit disturbing the way it was um and so i had i had my conservator lay it down on this backing sheet which i didn't want to match entirely the color of the paper but i wanted it to be less noticeable that it was you know the the, the left edge of the sheet um and that's something I did in consultation with the owner of the drawing before I did it. Um, but it made the drawing, um, you know, e easier to to read, and in, in a way, it, it presented itself better uh, in uh, it, when I came to frame it. If you look at the next image by Castiglione, um, Tom, this one here. Now, this was a lovely drawing by one of my favorite artists. When I um, when I came across it, I, as as I said, I unframe everything that I look at, and I noticed that it, the drawing had been torn in four pieces and then reassembled very well by obviously a very competent conservator. So much so that it's actually very hard to tell uh, when you when you look at it and let's look at it up close. You know where the tears are, and this was a case of of, of a drawing which. Um, I'm glad I unframed it. I'm glad I looked at it carefully. I decided in the end that even though it had been uh, it had been torn in four pieces and had been very well repaired, you know, I, 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 I still thought it was a wonderful image. The condition of the rest of the sheet, you know, uh, because the the um, the blue gouache, for example, um, was all original. And I, you know, I, I, I went ahead and bought it. Now, when I talk to a client about it, I will mention the fact that, you know, it was torn and I will point out where you can see, if you look very, very closely, uh, the, the, the quadrant, the, the tears. But, you know, again, as a dealer, you want to be as forthcoming as possible with, with potential clients or, or collectors or museums about, you know, what work you've, you've, either what work you've had done on a drawing that you own or what work has been done before you bought the drawing, but something that you can uh, mention, because I think it's important to do that. Um, but it is to me amazing, I think, what conservatives like Sarah and Harriet can actually do, because I mean, it's uh, uh, in many cases, it's it's it, it can bring, um, you know, it, it can bring a drawing really back to life. As we're as we're entering the last ten minutes or so, I'm going to uh, take some of our questions from our participants. Um, I'm just going to keep it on there and just take a look at what we've got. Um, so, one interesting question, actually, and it, it's very much relating to. Um, it very much relates to one of the questions that's come up for me um, in my mind is the sort of the ontological changes in um, in a drawing when it comes to conditions. So if there's too much intervention, does it stop being a drawing by the artist? Um, but then obviously when a drawing has degraded so much, then we don't so much think of it as being still by the artist. And um, one of our one of our participants has asked, um, they say patina on old luxury watches is regarded favorably. Um, so why is it often either not accepted? Why do people not accept it altogether on drawings and watercolors? Stephen, can you, you've probably got the most experience of, of dealing with people who both loathe condition damage and want things as bright as possible. And the client that you mentioned, the collector who he didn't mind at all. Um, it was all about the artist. I mean, I have the luxury of buying for stock drawings that I like, I love, and, I, and I've made the decision about whether the condition is acceptable or, or not. Um, and I understand it when a client comes to me and says, look, I, I love the drawing, but I think it's too, it's too, it, it's got issues. You know, the, the, I mean, for example, I have a Tiepolo drawing, a wonderful Tiepolo drawing that I haven't done anything to. I think it's a wonderful sheet. It does have some foxing, not in to my mind that disturbing, but to some clients, some collectors, it may be, particularly to an American museum curator, for example, who are, as we have said, have perhaps a higher threshold for that sort of thing. Or is it a lower threshold? I actually can't remember now, which is how, <laughs> is it a lower threshold for conservation or higher? Anyway, 
Um, but it's, it's um, you know, it's very much, I mean, the drawing is, uh, sometimes I'm asked by a potential client, you know, is, would you recommend that I do something with the, you know, with the drawing that I, that I take it to a conservator and have something done? And I will, I will tell them, you know, um, I chose not to do it for whatever reason uh, in this case, but yes, it is sometimes possible to, to, to do it, but um, it's very much a sort of, it's, it's a very objective thing. So I think in the, in a way, um, the question of patina is sort of interesting because unlike uh, a three-dimensional object or indeed a, a Japanese sword with your blood in it, um, <laughs> patina is something that it's hard to sort of put into uh, the context of a, of, of a work on paper. It, it may fade. Um, it may be damaged by, by, um, by foxing or, or silverfish or other issues. That doesn't necessarily add anything to its overall appearance. I mean, the age is something that, as I said earlier, does, you know, I, I tend to be someone who will have much more leeway in terms of condition for an, er for an earlier work than, than for a later work. Um, but um, I've, I've never really, I've never really sort of used the word patina when it comes to works on paper, at least personally. I think it's more a uh, a case of you know it, it is it is true that these are you know works on paper are relatively fragile things we know that light is is a particularly you know uh, can be very harmful if they're you know the number of the number of times I've, I've I've gone to a house of a friend not a client and and seen something you know in direct sunlight and sort of said you know please whatever that is I, it, it, you know if it, it could be a poster whatever please. You know, please don't do that. Um, but it's it's an interesting it's an interesting question. I, I, um, I in my personal case, I, I tend to sort of um, have a, 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 a the luxury, as I said, unlike say an auction house, of of being able to focus on works that that I like and works whose condition is already sufficiently good for me to be interested in them. Thanks, Stephen. Um, there's there's a couple of questions on sort of very specific um, problems with condition or concerns, and I think one which um, which is broadly speaking relatable to most people is the concern when hanging works on paper um, and photographs at home. Obviously, we now know after everyone's strict advice not to expose it to sunlight and not to handle it too often uh, to avoid those things. But is there a risk um, just in the first place of an item, a, a drawing or a photograph being on a wall, even behind museum UV resistant glass um, or plexiglass? Is there still a risk of the drawing still gradually deteriorating. Harriet, can you um, tell us a little bit about that? Well, I think ultimately everything deteriorates. And what we try to do in assessing risk and making these um, recommendations is to try to slow the process down as much as possible. So by using a UV filtering perspex, by using lights that are filtered for UV, um, you can extend the life of a work of art by years and years, centuries. Um, and so, you can't stop deterioration from happening 100%, but you can slow that process. And that's why collections are rotated to get the most life out of the art object over, um, over many, many years. Um, that's why material studies become important because when you start looking at the more modern and contemporary works, um, those, depending on what they're made of, tend to deteriorate at a faster rate and, and pre further precautions need to be taken. And in your thinking about where you want to display them, how you want to display them. But change is inevitable. Yeah, it's, um, again, it's a kind of, it's just part of the very nature of works on paper and photographs that they, they will constantly be changing and yeah you can either regard that as deterioration or 
that sort of very, very gradual change you can regard as as pattern. It's um it's part of the sort of state of mind we have to have when approaching them. Um I'm just looking through some of the other questions which have been posed. Um yeah, that's so when I think still very much in the mindset of um, a private collector rather than a museum. Um, is, there, is there a sort of baseline humidity, temperature, and kind of overall atmospheric condition which things should be kept at? Um, or from the private collector's perspective, I guess, the, as opposed to the museum, is, is it a fairly broad spectrum of conditions which works can be kept in? Um, James, your this is a concern which must come up all the time as you've got both you've got both collectors who want to live with everything and those that are very happy to keep them in perfect storage. Um, what do you advise in terms of the home collection? Is there a sort of a necessity? Yeah, I, I think as, as we touched on before, I think it's the approach to the conservation of the works, understanding that they go through a a process of, of gradual deterioration, um, which which Harriet's talked about, um, and and adjusting and using materials and up to date technology to to help preserve those works for as long as possible. Um, and and Stephen obviously <laughs> direct sunlight on on artworks is is going to be a problem. Um, so just acting prudently to do the best that you can to to protect your artworks and and photography uh, works on paper um, and I think you know unfortunately most insurance will exclude the gradual deterioration of, of works so it, it puts the owners back on the owners to ensure that the conditions that they're stored in are the best possible um, so keeping photographs in a, in a damp storage space is, is not going to be beneficial <laughs> to, to anybody um so so obviously if you can avoid that and and think about the kind of conditions even temperatures that that you need um for for the types of artworks um it's it's going to be save you headache and and also means that you get to enjoy your artworks for as, for as long as possible i think it is if i can just say i think it is interesting also because sometimes the best laid plans i I still remember many years ago, I was on holiday in Italy and I went to uh, a, a small town where Raphael had once worked. And in, this, in the museum in this town, they had a tiny exhibition devoted to Raphael. It was basically one painting that they had borrowed from private collector and two drawings, one of which came from the British Museum. And I went into the exhibition and I saw the British Museum's drawing in a glass case with a bright halogen light, shine, very bright halogen light shining in it from about six to eight inches away. <laughs> I mean, it was, I, I left the museum, I called up Hugo Chapman, the British Museum, I said, Hugo, I don't know what you're doing with the drawing, you've got to stop this, this is, this is not good. And, um, you know, so I mean, this was a museum, uh, a small one, albeit, you know, a museum in, 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 uh, in Tuscany, but it, you know, it sometimes, uh, these sort of things still take you aback a bit. Well, certainly we've come um, to the end of the hour. Um, so I just want to say thank you very much to all of our panelists for their, their fascinating insights and advice um, and to London Art Week for organising this and the numerous other talks um, that have taken place in this particular edition of um, of London Art Week's panel talks, and there will be more um, over the course over the course of the year during during the summer event, um, the actual Art Week itself, and then during the uh, final part of part of the year. Um, so I'm just going to leave us on the landing page, and as I go through, um, everyone can see some of the images shared by the panelists which give an idea of condition deterioration and possibilities. Brilliant. Thank you very much, everyone. And um, look forward to seeing all of you again at various times throughout the year.
Thanks. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all. Thanks.